cloud. Anyway, it's just kind of a funny moment. <clears throat> we just said, in Jesus' name, speak that cloud. You know, we need rain. We don't need storms. We just need rain. Yeah. And uh, we were just talking about the name. Name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Name above every name. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Bo. I've been talking to a man for three years about Jesus on Facebook. Yes. Yesterday he texted me. We were just late. He said, can you call us? I knew I couldn't call the kids around. Mm-hmm. Amen. Praise God, Bo. Let's give Jesus a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Randy Arnold. I probably know Randy Arnold. But Father, we pray for Randy Arnold right now. Father, we speak to his lungs in Jesus' name. We command them to be clear. Father, it sounds cancerous, but we don't know. But we curse whatever is attacking him in Jesus' mighty name. Father God, we thank you for being with doctors, nurses, Father, everybody involved in this, his family. Father God, the faith would arise, the enemy would be scattered in Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you for touching Randy. Jesus mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, God always gives us opportunity, like Brother Bo said, that was a great, great thing, great way to, to start. Um, Marcia was anticipating, of course, coming to church tonight, being here, and she came and uh, found me this afternoon uh, and said she had uh, her day had not gone according to her plan, but it evidently went according to God's plan. And so she's still working. Uh, because she took two hours. I was telling Bruce on the way here, she took two hours. About a week ago, she told me about this young man at work who's a, an agnostic, a, 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 an atheist, agnostic, don't believe um, in God. And uh, she stepped out, you know, on company time, on a company call, and told him about the Lord, something. Today, it, uh, the conversation came back around, and they were talking about the movie we went and saw, Brother Mike and Shay and, and Carly and... Casey went last night, and Marsha and I went and saw Sound of Freedom and uh, about uh, child trafficking, pedophilia and stuff. That's been big on Marsha's heart for the last, you know, two, three, four years. And so uh, uh, she wouldn't have missed that movie for nothing um, uh, just to see the war uh, against such evil against children. Um, but anyway, it opened up a conversation with this young man today who him and his wife are from Mexico, and she, he began to say that, uh, tell her the facts uh, about Mexico and about trafficking. And he told her, he said, don't go too deep into it. He kept telling her, and she was like, well, we're already pretty deep into it. You know, we've done a lot of study, but uh, the reason he was telling her that, he said, because it gets so dark and so troublesome. She was like, well, that's, we, we trust the Lord for that part, but we're not going to ignore the problem. And uh, But two hours she ministered to him on the telephone. By the end, he said, I know that there's a God. Um, I know that there's a God. He said, I'm just trying to understand why it's Jesus and not Muhammad or, you know, uh, you know, somebody else. You know, literally he said, you know, another God. And, uh, of course, that's what she was telling him for two hours. So, so, Brother Bo, God's working on folks Amen. that said they'd never believe. That they'd never believe. But Randy, I think they opened up that road a few minutes ago. Really? Praise God. Well, maybe our road's open. Which road? Which road is this? That's on North Center? Yeah. Great. And uh, one last, just a little testimony on my behalf, I want to get to the word, is that um, we were invited yesterday on the 4th. We were invited to, uh, with Shonda and Jerry, to a friend's house. And 
They had a swimming pool there on Cane River in a, a pontoon boat. And Shonda told me, said, uh, we're just going to invite this, uh, this doctor, this uh, surgeon there, I guess, a Rapid General, a uh, young surgeon and his wife who she works with. And she said, he's my favorite doctor. And so they're, they're uh, engaged. They're not married, the, the young couple. So it was just us, six adults and the two girls. And uh, we had a wonderful afternoon. And anyway, we got done eating and everything and found us um, just everybody else just kind of in the pool waiting around with the kids and stuff like that. And uh, me and that couple uh, just sitting talking where they could all hear us, but just sitting there talking. And uh, God opened up a conversation uh, that I was, uh, it just fell right in line with uh, something I love to talk about, about, about the Lord and how he created us. And um, so I'm talking to a surgeon and his soon-to-be wife who is uh, going to be a psychologist. And, um, and when we got done everything, I knew God had touched both of them. I just knew he did. And... Uh, uh, God has all wisdom. He's amazing. And so uh, Shonda called me on the way to church and said uh, they weren't going to be able to make it. But, um, and she said, you know, doc, Dr. Raj came in and he said, um, that was amazing conversation with your brother yesterday. God, so another, Bo, no total unbeliever. God's touching their lives. <laughs> I did. He couldn't believe. Amen. It's kind of what I'm going to talk about, I think, tonight. Um, yeah, I might just give some, some scripture. Um, first one I wanted to start with, I just want to say, but I believe that we are. But if you go to Romans 13, I just want to use this. I'm starting start in verse 11. Um, you know, we've been talking about the five-fold ministry and all those things. Eventually, it's going to all tie back together. But tonight, I want to not teach, really. I, I'm, I'm just going to talk to you, really, um, however it comes out, teaching, preaching, or talking. But um, the, the verses above this, this text, uh, he's talking about us walking in love and how that, that walking in love is the fulfillment of the law. And we can read those scriptures, but what he talks about, he said it's summed up in this, that uh, if we love our neighbor as ourself. And, and so he's talking about love, and, and, and here's... Uh, here's the thing that I've had against the love message is that, is that just like the faith message, grace message, prosperity message, or any other message, um, people can go down a, a long road off track with the message. And you would say, well, we can't go too far off track with the love message. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Not if we don't understand what real love is. And so if we have one concept of love, uh, then, then we're not understanding. And, and so we have to have full uh, understanding of love. And I saw when I came to the church early on that one of you wise teachers had in your room the different kinds of love up there. Shay, was that you? Was Shay in here? Okay, she's with you. But somebody had it on there, different ones, phileo and agape. Okay, well, all right, it was Richie, y'all. I've never, ever ever ever. Never. So, so, you know, it was talking about different kinds of love, agape, phileo, uh, and it goes on and on. There's, you know, five, six different kinds of love. And when we look at those, uh, you know, they are everything from friendship love, family love, erotic love. There are different kinds of love, brotherly love. Uh, you know, and the, one of the ones that they use the most in the Bible is, is really brotherly love or when it talks about us loving our neighbor, it, it really refers to, to, you know, holding a love feast or it's where something is prepared where others can come and benefit and that's an act of love. That's why hospitality is an act of love. And so when we look at these different expressions, you know, um, 
uh, all I'm going to say about that, because I want to get to some way different things, um, is the fact is, is, that, is that when you do an action out of love, the action may not look like love, but it could be love. Disciplining your child could be love, but it hurts their butt badly. Yeah, God loves us so much that He'll chasten us, and if He don't chasten us, we're a bastard child. We're fatherless. Well, I can guarantee you when you're going through the butt whipping, it ain't fun. You ain't going, He loves me so much. <laughs> you're not. You're not. But you know He does. You'll look back on it and go, had I not went through that, had He not corrected me, I'd have destroyed my life. He loves me. And so we got to have a bigger concept. It's not always a coddling, but it's always a loving. Now when you learn that nature of God like that, you'll find out a lot of things through the Bible when it looks really crazy that He was still loving. He was still loving. It was just an expression we're not used to. You know what I mean? God would bring judgment on a people because He loved the righteous so much. He would preserve the righteous by bringing judgment on others because He loves so much. See, God loves everybody, I believe, the same. We know that the Jews are the apple of His eye. We know that. But God loves everybody, but not everybody loves God. So your love back to Him can dictate a lot of times the amount of His love that you experience. It's not based on how much he loves. It's based on how much you love him back. Well, that, that's, that's proven by what he said to Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? And so if I broke that down, those are different loves. He said, if you love me, he said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. See, because there's a love that comes out, that, that is saying, we can't say we love him unless we obey him. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. So sometimes we're expecting all this love from God, but God's saying, you can't experience my full love unless you want to start becoming obedient. Then when you're obedient, my child, I can show you more how much I love you. And so there's an exchange. Peter said, well, Lord, see, Peter didn't want to, Jesus had, you know, had already left them and all that. Peter's like, no, I done went back fishing. He said to him again, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you have the God kind of love for me? Agape love is a giving love for God so loved agape the world. Meaning that that kind of love is where you say, I'm last and I give myself totally to him. That's the difference in in erotic love or, or uh, social love or family love, uh, you know, even the Father. We say the Father's love. Agape is where He agape us so we can agape Him. He, he, said, he said, I love you so much I gave everything. I gave my only son. He said, you're going to have to love me so much you surrender your life and give me everything. Then when we do that, we're able to agape our brothers, our, our neighbors and people around us. The Bible said in the last day the love of many would wax cold because iniquity would abound. There'd be so much sin you would just get fed up with people and it's hard to love them. We're living that right now. Some people are just hard to love. They are, come on. I know I ain't the only one to struggle with it. I mean, there's some people, you know, they're hard to like, much less love, you know what I mean? Then there's those doggone people, it's easier to love them when you ain't nowhere around them, you know what I'm saying? It's easier to love them from a distance. That's true, too. That is true. Hallelujah. But finally, he said, hey, if you love me, you'll feed my lambs. And he said, do you love me? He said, Lord, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. He was trying to get it through to Peter and he did that if you say you love me, that has an action with it. You can't say it here and do nothing with this here. Doesn't, that's not love. So we can say, we, you know, I ain't even want to talk about love tonight. Ain't even on my mind or my note. 
There it is. Uh, and that's just kind of half-baked. But here's where I'm going is, is this chapter we're looking at, I want to look at tonight, the, uh, just the beginning here of these verses. He said this love right here, it is the catalyst, it is the absolute fuel of the fire of our motive, of our actions, of everything. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. A church won't get on fire for God unless they love Him. When you fall in love with Him, all of a sudden you're ready to do for Him. And a person can't say they love Him, but they won't do anything for Him. Now people say that all the time. I make fun of that, and you've heard me use this illustration because it just always blew my mind. When I was a teenager, that family, half of them lived with us. Every time they'd leave the house. When we'd leave the house, we didn't tell mom and daddy we loved them. They knew it. We just, mom, I'll be back later. All right, baby, y'all be careful. That's what was said. Y'all heard that many times. This family said, mama, we're leaving, and we love you. She'd say, baby, I love y'all too. And they'd be fighting like dogs an hour later with the cops called. <laughs> they never came to my house. We never fought like that. We didn't tell each other. You get what I'm saying? They didn't love each other. They were insecure in who they were, so they would say that to each other, but they didn't love each other. That mother did not love those children. She left them all the time in all kind of harm's way. It's why my family rescued them. So be clear, church, don't tell him you love him, but you're not willing to do anything for him. Don't, don't fool yourself. Don't say you love people, but you're not willing to help others. You see what I'm saying? Let's, so the worst thing, last week I talked about deception, the worst thing we could ever do is deceive ourselves. I'm an awesome man of God. I don't love nobody. That's a faux pas. That don't work. That don't, that don't work. You know what I'm saying? He said that's the second greatest commandment. Number one, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind. Number two, I love my neighbor as myself. And so I tell people this. The problem is, is that if you, if you know you love God, you're willing to do whatever for Him, but you're not sure you love people, you better look and see how much you love yourself. Because you can never love somebody else more than you love yourself. And that's not a weird love. It's true. I like me. All right, now I can like my wife. I don't like me. I don't like my wife. Everything she does is wrong. No, you don't like yourself. Let me get off that. That's a little bit of counseling. Let's move on. <laughs> All right, let's look at this. Y'all with me uh, there in whatever we're at, Romans 13? Look what he says. Let's go to verse thir- uh, 11. And that, knowing that the time, high, now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the arm of light. Y'all listen to me. The one thing that is absolutely clear right now, July, what, 6th now? Is this 5th? It's 5th. July 5th, 2023. Darkness is abounding in the world. The one thing that I am realizing more every week is that the more truth God reveals, the more I realize I've been in darkness. The more truth that God reveals, the more I know I've been in darkness. We were talking about, all right, for example, I'm going to use for example that movie last night about child trafficking and pedophilia. If I would have wrote down, which sometimes I do that, I love statistics. I love fact. I love fact from God's Word. I love fact in the world. I love fact. Something you can say, that's a truth. They were talking about the multiplied thousands of pornographic images. Every day, the multiplied hundreds of thousands of images that are downloaded in America. This is one sin... You know, it's a bunch of them, but you get what I'm saying. It's one line of, of, of sin, and it's an p- epidemic. We're not talking about any of the others, and there are many. If I talked about all of them, it'd just be cumbersome and nasty and dark, and we'd just be, oh. But when I think about it, when I think about the world, 
when I think about America, when I think about the culture that our children will be raised in, my grandchildren, when I think about my hometown of Colfax, what it was like when I was a child and the fine families that were around there and the businesses and when I go through our towns, what happens to my heart and, and, and everything. And I'm here to tell you that it can be overwhelming to the point where you say there's no use. Or we can believe Father God has a plan. But no matter what, we're the answer. Sitting here tonight is the answer. And that's really my message to you tonight is we're the answer. Brother Bo, it's the reaching out to the friend on Facebook and getting that call. It's letting our light shine at all times because we never know when it's that moment that somebody need, will receive salvation where somebody will not open up their heart and their life be changed forever. It is that moment that we must always be prepared. But Bo, I'm going to be honest with you. It is so hard for all of us to get up on a daily basis and make Jesus so much Lord that we are cognizant, that we are attentive, that we are acknowledging that today is the day of the Lord. We are so, there's so much, listen to me church, this is not a condemning statement. I'm trying to make a point that you got to realize that it's not because you're a bad person. Hear what I'm telling you right now. By the grace of God, you're going you're gonna to see it. You're going to receive this. Here's the fact. We are under great attack. We are under great attack of darkness. That's why Isaiah said there will be darkness on the earth, gross darkness, the people. If if I, unless I am the oddball out, I have to get up every day and make a conscious decision, today is the day of the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Every day, how do I pray? Amen. My Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. The acknowledgement of today you might want to use me. Today is important Amen. in the scope of eternity. For somebody's life, today might be life changing. Amen. We got to be ready. We got to be ready. We got to be ready, church. We got to be ready. You're, you are the only hope some people will ever get. You, me, I'm not condemning you. I'm trying to fire you up. You are the hope. You got the word in you. You got God in you. You got the power in you. You're the hope. We're the hope. Yes, God. They might be stealing children. They might be selling drugs. I saw in Shreveport, just an example yesterday, a, a party get together of people Drive-by shooter, kills four of them, wounds ten. That's always happening in Natchitoches and around here. On the way uh, to church right up the road, uh, Bruce said, you know, Brother Randy, he said, we're out here in this, in this country and most of us have good lives. You, you know, we, we, we're kind of like insulated or isolated from some of these crazy things that happen in other places in the world. And I said, Bruce, you're 100%. It just was all over me, the, the anointing of God. I said, you're 100%, 100%, 100%, 100% correct. But that's why we have to, it's even more difficult for us sometimes to engage in what's happening in the world because it hadn't come to our family yet. Your grandbaby hasn't been trafficked yet. Your child hasn't been snatched at Walmart yet. You know what we deal with mostly in our congregation? Sick folk. Because sickness is everywhere.
But we got to love our brother like ourselves. But we got to pray for those before it comes to our house. We're the answer. We're the answer. We're the answer. So I was asked, so what do we do? Number one, it starts with, with number one where I'm at right here, waking up. It starts with waking up. It does. It starts with waking up. I'm, I'm talking to me. And if you break this down to not like he's preaching at me, but if we could be a family tonight, and you would say, Brother Randy, I need that. I need to wake up. I need to stop ignoring the pain around me. I need to stop ignoring everything that's going on. Listen to me. It's not for you to be overwhelmed. It's not for you to be Jesus and put the burden on your shoulders. It's for you to pray. It's for you to seek the face of God for other people. It's for you to call on heaven to rain His grace and mercy down. It's for God to send the right people across these people's path that can minister deliverance, healing, rescuing, or whatever they need. God will send somebody. He's looking for a man. He's wanting somebody to say, send me. But all of us can pray. Evil prevails, I said something, you know, when good men do nothing. We all know that statement. But listen to me. Listen to me. The the church must, part of the sleeping, part of the being in darkness is when we think that we can't make a difference. That is part of the sleeping. I said when you're asleep, some of us are light sleepers and some of us are not. There's some people you could knock down the house and they wouldn't hear you. Well, I think... I think there's different levels of sleep in the church. I think some people that uh, the whole world could, could, you know, nuclear bomb could just, you know, and they think everything's still fine. Um, And then there's others. There's little things happening that wakes you up and you see pretty quickly what's going on. But, you know, one of the things that uh, has kind of been a heartbeat, you know, for me has uh, been... You know, a couple of Sundays ago, I preached. You know, about uh, in the on the name of Jesus. I started out just talking about the benefits, how so many people seek the benefits for themselves, but yet there's multiplied millions around the world, and they're just dying for a benefit of the Lord Jesus. They're just dying for salvation. They're just dying for some hope. You know, just longing for some hope in their situation. There's pain, deep pain, all around this world. Grievous things happening in other countries. If you tune in to the, into, you know, not our world news, but to some real good Christian world news, you know, you find out how they are rioting in other countries and Turkey and different ones where, you know, all kind of things, upheavals are happening. You find out things that are happening in the Ukraine and in Russia and in China and everything that's happening in the world. And it's a lot. And again, we can't be... You can't tonight be um, a, a weak Christian, a weak person, and say, I just can't take it. I hear all that. I can't handle it. Then you're trying to do it in your own strength because greater is he that's in you than he that's out here in this world. It's not your burden to carry. Cast all of the, the of your care on the Lord for he cares for you. It's not for you to carry the burden. Jesus said, he said, put my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy and is light. He said, he said, hook up with me and let me carry this with you. But I need somebody in the earth that will engage in the problem. Amen. The church is the answer. We are the answer. That is the ecclesia. He is waiting for the church to rise up in its authority. He is waiting for the church to rise up in its authority and its love and its compassion for other people. He is. He is. That's all true. So I was just thought, uh, I'm just going to start tonight by saying that uh, the night is far spent. You know, when when I look at a lot of different uh, timetables, I'm not predicting tonight. But I have done this. I've studied a lot on, on the, uh, the different timetables uh, in the Bible. And if you, if, you went by, if you went by millenniums, if you went by um, the, the feasts and the holidays of the Jewish uh, calendar, if you went by the, uh, uh, the 50-year jubilees, you go by all of these different different ways of calculating 
um, a, a, a you know, close estimate of a projected time of the Lord, it is fully possible. I said it's fully possible. It is fully possible that a time that to, to be aware of would be 2030. It's a, it's, a, it's a possibility. And I mean a high one. I mean a high one. But what I do know is whether the Lord will come back in 2030 or not, I do know this, that we're in critical mass right now. We're in critical times. I said we're in critical times right now in the earth. We are. We are. Because right now you and I still have the, the liberty to move around freely and to have free speech. I mean, you know, when the Internet doesn't censor it, but to one another, free speech, open communication, open travel. And, and so it's a great opportune time for the body of Christ all around the world. Be praying for other ministries and ministers all around the world that this glorious gospel will go out to every creature, that everyone would get the opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, we'll get into some of that other another time. He said in verse 12, he said, well, he's ended... By saying, he said, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe, when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so, uh, again, he's just talking about activation. Activation in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the darkness. What is darkness, uh, Brother Randy? Well, ignorance is darkness. It's a, it's, it's a lack of knowledge is darkness. Uh, error is darkness. Wrong knowledge is darkness. Sin is darkness. Rebellion is darkness. Foolishness is darkness. All these things are darkness. All the things that are opposite of the character of God or the truth of God is darkness. And, uh, and it is that, that, uh, that darkness uh, that really hinders uh, the brightness of His light shining through our life. And so, so Father, we do thank You that You just fill us full of light. Father God, you give us full truth that we could walk in it, that the world could see it. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chambering. It says, and not in wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And so um, that's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful stuff. Um, So a lot of times, a lot of days, I just think to myself, I just, I'm riding down the road and everything, and I think, Lord, I don't know if y'all have thoughts like this. Maybe somebody will connect with it. But I'm just going to reiterate really what my heart's saying. I'm driving down the road, and I'm thinking, Father God, it's a, it's a good day, or Father, this is going on, or I need to do that, and this, that, and the other, and this person has this need, and this, that, and the other. And you know, all that's good, but uh, I can't help but think sometime, even in prayer, even in thought, just the feeling in myself that, uh, Father, I'm not making this as significant, your kingdom or your acknowledgement as I should. You know, I just, I just, I, you know, I just, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm making you as big as you ought to be. You know, I don't, I don't know if I've given you the attention. Or, uh, again, what am I talking about there? What he said right here, he said, walk after the spirit, not after the flesh to make provision thereof. Father, I might have been thinking too much about about, you know, other natural things I need to do rather than the spiritual things that you want to do, you know. Uh, but I'm just encouraging you because it's all our own individual walk and we're none ever probably going to, you know, get it perfect. But, but it's your choice every day how you live your life and what you do and to the degree you do it. And, you know, I'm not the judge. You may be walking, you know, you, you know on clouds, you know what I mean? You may be you and God just walking like that. But for those of us who are not, you know, you know what I'm saying? Or, or that feel like we could step up our game, especially in these times. I want you to know that the war or the battle against darkness is real. It's real. It's real. And so there, there is always so much happening in this world, uh, in your life, or around you to distract you from Him, to get your attention, to take priority in everything else. And, uh, and you know, it... That's just the way this life is. And so we have to be careful. We have to guard ourselves that, that uh, you know, he's not last. Amen? Amen. He's not last. Hallelujah. So um, see where I want to kind of conclude on a few things, a few thoughts. 
So I told you, um, we were talking, um, Pastor Lamar and I talked about this. Um, I talked to us about it, you know, with other people as well. But um, if I ask you tonight, if I ask you tonight, what does the church, what does our church need more than anything? And I ain't talking about in the natural. It could be because somebody might think, well, we need more, you know, potlucks. <laughs> I'm, just, you know, I'm just making up funny stuff. You know what I'm saying? It could be anything. Or I think we don't need anything else. I think we're great or whatever. Um, see, the, the thing about the way I'm, I'm, I'm made is the fact that um, until I really see the lives transforming that I know Father wants to transform, um, I have to ask him, what do I need to do to see that transformation? And so this next generation, we talked about it last week, and I gave you the statistics of how many stay in church or claim to be Christians in America, and it's shocking in this uh, Z generation or whatever they call this one now. Um, it is shocking the, the amount of unbelief that our children have. But I think that brings me back to the fact that, um, you know, when Jude said I, I, to earnestly contend for the faith which once was delivered to the saints. Right. To earnestly contend. And so most, most of the kids I grew up with that were in church that are now, of course, uh, middle-aged adults, not a lot of them are still in church. And a lot of them grew up in full gospel churches around here. And they won't darken the door of a church. Well, I do thank God that I had different experiences than they had. Uh, I do. And it's sad because a lot of them got a lot of religion, didn't get as much uh, Jesus or, or truth or, you know, they, they didn't get the experience, but they got some other things. The, the, the doctrine, the condemnation, the bondage, whatever it was. And so now they're like, I'm not going. I mean, I can't even get them interested. And uh, they'll even tell you, I'm sure God's good and everything, Randy. I believe in Jesus, but I ain't doing that religion. I ain't doing that. And so all I'm telling you is, is, that, is that one of the things I look at when... when uh, You've heard me say this before, and I'm just going to get to the get to the punchline. I um, years back, every church prayed for revival. We wanted revival. That was that was the golden egg of the church. You know what I mean? That was the that was the thing. That was the cream of the crop. That was the deal. Is that if you had an outpouring of the Spirit of God in, in your church, you know, and uh, Brownsville fueled that fire more. We had uh, we had it up in in uh, in Canada. You know, we had it uh, in St. Louis. We had it, you know, in, in other places. I mean, actually a bunch of places. And uh, Brownsville was just one of the ones that was known best. Uh, Carpenter's Home Church in Florida actually had a revival um, with Rodney Hyde Brown. And uh, so um, I saw God pour out his spirit. I told you all before the thing that, uh, that I wish I would have had more wisdom and understanding was that we would have had the support system uh, that we have here in this church to be able to take care of the harvest, to be able to mentor, to be able to disciple, to be able to just go visit and call on and pray with brand new believers that don't know anything because the enemy comes in to try to take them out as quick as you can get them in. And uh, I didn't have that support. And uh, what I'm going to tell you tonight and I guess where I'm kind of going with everything happening in, in the world is, is that I think we have an awesome church. But I'm feeling in my spirit, I'm finally going to say, because I battled with the Lord. I wouldn't have said some things to you if it wasn't kind of a battle. So y'all know from what I've told you that when, what I'm fixing to say, it was a battle. Um, but after last week, the Lord really started dealing with my heart more and more, and he said, he said to me, you do need an outpouring. And I was like, well, we're not dead. He said, no, but this generation needs to see. And uh, so 
So I, I literally, so I'm talking from the heart. This ain't preach, this is talk. I'm sharing my heart with you. Knew a church in Tulsa who had a mighty man of faith as their leader. And it amazed me because over 30 years they prayed for revival. He died last year. He was, had as much influence on my life, you know, was not maybe anybody, but he had a lot of influence on my life. One of the most mighty men of God I've ever known, anointed of God. Signs, wonders, and miracles in his ministry. I mean miracles. <clears throat> but God had showed him a vision of where multiplied thousands of people would come getting saved, delivered, and everything in their church. And that the power of God would be so strong that he would even empty out the hospitals. I don't, I don't doubt his vision. I'm not, it's not my place to judge that man of God. But one thing I knew from the three experiences I had, two in particular where God's spirit just poured out on a, on a town or a location. I knew that he somehow they got so deep into praying for it they never could believe for it. Now I know what I'm telling you. I know what I'm telling you. There is prayer that must happen for a people to see God do something supernatural that, that pastors can't do. You know what I mean? We could have 20 on staff pastors and you can't do what God can do in one service when he shows up. And, and I don't want to be a church that just seeks revival. We're not going to do like that. But yet I want to stir you to say, I want to stir your heart to say, if I said, let's don't pass it off to the next generation, but if I said to you tonight, just you individually, do you need reviving? If I said to you tonight, do you want an experience with God that you can't explain, but it's just His presence, it's just His power, His glory? And... uh So there were steps of getting to that place, but the very first one I told you before was the recognition that we need it. So here's the thing is, is that that is the most humble statement for some people in church to make, is to say, we need something more. Yes. That, friends, is why most churches don't get it. Because they say we're good. And they never get more. When I went to Cushing, Oklahoma and began to preach uh, faith and grace and everything that we preached, they said, we've got to reach this community. We need God. I said, yes, we do. And we began to pray for a supernatural move of God that was beyond the wonderful services we was already having. And I've told you the story before, but the one thing, it's so many elements, but get this. These men and women looked at their self and said, we're hungry for more. They looked this pastor in the face and said, we want more. I said, then let's go follow me. We will get there. We will find him. Paul said, follow me as I follow the anointing. And we prayed for months until that day the Lord spoke to me in Smithton, Missouri. And I told you that story, but it's the true story. And when he told me to go home and have revival, I had no idea what was going to happen that night when I stepped in front of a podium just like this and said, who wants God? I didn't know he was going to fill the building. He could have left me standing there all alone. But I knew his word. He gave me a promise. He gave you a promise. 
And I'll probably just wrap up with this in Acts chapter 3. The power of God, the Holy Ghost have been poured out at Pentecost. It tells us that they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It goes into chapter 2 and talks about how all of these other nationalities heard them speak in their tongue. And it's a list of them. And they said, how is this? And Peter stood up. He began to proclaim to them. But boy, those scribes and Pharisees, this was on the next, next morning they were going to the temple and that young man was laid there lame. He was asking alms in chapter 3. And old Peter said, Look, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise and walk. And lifting him up, his ankles gained strength, and he began to walk and leap and praise God. And as he danced through the temple... They said, is this not the one laid daily at the gate, beautiful, lame in his feet? And Peter, standing in the midst of them, said, My brothers, I tell you this day, that this man you see walking was not done by our power. But in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom you crucified, him, has God highly exalted. Set him at his right hand until his enemies become his footstool. But you, they said, let's look at it in verse, what, verse uh, 19. Uh, Let's look at it real quick. Let's start in verse 14. It says, But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses in His name, through faith in His name. We back to that name. Hallelujah. I'm going to get happy. We get on that name. Glory to God. Hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. He said, Y'all know him now. He's a friend of some of y'all's. He says, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He said, y'all can't deny it. Look at him dancing and celebrating. And all now, brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it as did your rulers. He said, I'm going to just tell you right now, I know y'all killed this King Jesus out of ignorance. He let him off a hook. What love, what, what graciousness. Hallelujah. But those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Now look what he said. Repent ye therefore. We backed Acts 2.38. He said, change your mind. Y'all going to have to stop thinking that he's just a carpenter's son. You're going to have to stop thinking that you got religion right. You're going to have to stop thinking the way you've been thinking about the things of God. You're going to have to change the way you think. Repent, change the way you think therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus the anointed one which was before preached unto you whom heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has before spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. He said you can change the way you think and be converted, be changed. And times, opportunities of refreshing or revival will come. There's your key right there. When a person's mind shifts and says, I don't have all of God that I want, I'm going to stop acting like I got it all. I don't, Father. I need more. I'm looking at myself. I ain't looking at nobody else. That's one thing I know about this kingdom. Can't nobody go with me. Can't nobody hold me back. Yes, sir. 
have to be honest before God. Randy, who are you before God? What kind of man are you? How much do you love him? How much? And when we stop self-justifying and self-promoting and self, uh, you know, all those things, we say, Father, I want all of you. He said, I'll give you an occasion, an opportunity for revival. And so when I revive you, when I restore you, when I refresh you, recovered from the effects of this world, recovered fully from the effects of the heat, recovered from the trials, he said, when I have restored you, there will be a restitution of all things. All of a sudden, I'll bring back things you've lost. All of a sudden, you'll recover stuff that you couldn't get where you were. I will win those in your family that you've been trying for years because you couldn't do it where you were at. But I will bring, I'll rescue. I will bring restitution of all things. That, my friends is revival. That, my friends, is revival. That ain't goosebumps. That's God changing lives. That's God changing me. And then because I've humbled myself, He took hold with me. And what He done in me, it just swoops out of me and flows through my life. He pulls the net in and He says, I'm recovering all. How many of y'all believe that? Well, since I'm out of time, I'm just going to tell you about it. In Joel chapter 2, he said, I'll restore unto you the years that the enemy has stolen. This is the New Testament confirmation of Joel chapter 2. You understand me? This is it. The restitution of all things. How does he restore the years? Because in one day he can restitute and bring back to you things that you have lost over the years. Things that you couldn't do in the next 20 years. He can do it in days. He can do it. He can do it. He can do it. I seen them young men come out of the, the, the satanic coven worshiping God. It would have took years of, 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 of mental, you know, psychological reevalu, you know, retraining. It would have took deliverance. Then they'd have had to go into a, a drug rehab and all those. No, sir. One moment changed. Changed. They never came back to my church dragging in, Brother Randy, I'm depressed and I'm defeated. They came in, Jesus! Amen. Jesus! You're just like, Lord have mercy, I'm hanging on to their coattail. I mean, they was like, I'm serious. I mean, I saw it. You're like, Lord, have mercy. They didn't know enough to be depressed. They didn't, they didn't, they hadn't been religiousized enough to know that they gotta calm down and you know it's things hard. I ain't saying they stayed on fire for 10 years or 100. I don't know. But I know one of them's a youth pastor. You know, I'm just knowing God changed their life. I just know He changed their life. And I know that God done wonderful things in many other families, not just those boys. I know He did it in other families and healed people and delivered people. That's all I know. I love this. In the revival, we say we need an outpouring. He said he'd pour out his spirit on all flesh in the last days. Did he not say that? Your sons and your daughters prophesy. Old men dream dreams, young men see visions. Hallelujah. Boy, you get woke up at night with a vision, you'll say, now I know what to do. And now I know what to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
That's what's going to fire me up is when I say, come on, now we know how to help you do it. Because God done showed you what to do. Hallelujah. It ain't for us just to see it all. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But I want you to catch this in that scripture. He said, and he will send Jesus. Did y'all see that in Acts? Did y'all see that? Huh? Raise your hand. Let me see. You saw that? He said, and he'll send Jesus. Yes, God. Woo! He's waiting till all his enemies be made his footstool. He'll look over at the Father and say, look at them. They're all under my feet. Do you understand that's his glory? That's his glory. When me and you are walking in victory and we're tearing hell up, a person can't stay addicted around here, can't stay depressed, can't stay suicidal, can't, can't stay addicted to alcohol or drugs, just can't do it. Can't stay sick, can't stay with cancer, can't stay nothing, can't stay nothing broken. Ha <laughs> ha, nothing broken. Can't come around here broken, you ain't gonna, it's going to get fixed. God's going to rescue it. He's going to bring a restitution to all things. Guess what? The church has always put on that Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Well, I'm going to say Lord Jesus. I'm just, we sins Jesus. I said Jesus done defeated death, hell, and the grave. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is one that comes, yeah, he gives us power. But it's something when Jesus shows back up in his church by his spirit. He's the king and it's all under his feet. The Bible never said it was all under the Holy Ghost feet, but it's under Jesus' feet. I said sickness, death, all of it's under his feet. He'll show back up. We'll host the Spirit of God. Yeah, I'm not trying to really differentiate between the Holy Ghost and Jesus. You know, they're fused, they're one. But I'm just saying when the Spirit of the Lord Jesus shows up in the form of the Holy Ghost in our midst and by His Spirit, man, I'm telling you something, you're hosting the King. It'll change lives. So, so uh, I'm going to close with this state, uh, two statements that number one, number one, with things that we are our desire and where we're trying to pursue is that right there. And I'll be honest with y'all, the only way I know you know to say it, the fact is this is just how I'm made. I, I, got not, I don't have a ton other to offer. I believe God wants his church in the last days full of glory. I believe that he's coming back for a glorious church, one without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. I believe he's coming back for a church that is on fire. I believe he's coming back for a victorious church that are more than conquerors. I believe he's coming back for a church that has overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I believe he's coming back for a mighty people. Those that know their God will be mighty and do exploits. I believe he's looking for those kind of people. I believe he's looking for that kind of church. I believe that's why I believe that's why God, what he's doing right here in our midst, he's stirring you, he's stirring you. Father, stir them tonight, God. Father, stir them right now, God. Stir them right now, God. Stir them right now, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I've seen him do the unspeakable. I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. And my point is this, is that... Uh, if we see him do it, all of a sudden, you're talking about praise and honor and glory. You're talking about a generation then that doesn't say, is he real? Or why are we going to church every Sunday? All of a sudden, they say he's high and lifted up. Hallelujah. They say he's king. I mean, he's king. We're not going to lose a generation. We're not going to lose a generation. We ain't going to lose an older generation. We ain't going to lose nobody. We ain't going to lose nobody. No, we're fighting darkness. We're fighting darkness with the word of God. We're going to win. We're going to win. Hallelujah. So all I was saying to you was this right here. This right here. When it comes to the church, I'm going to tell you, you know, it's big decisions I'm making, trying to, you know, do and get stuff around my house so we can still put it on the market and working and trying to keep the other lot up till we can do And I mean, it's just, you know, to me crazy. And Marsha Swamp and all, but, but there's a lot of positive too. But here's what I'm telling you is I know that uh, we're going to have to have corporate prayer right here in this sanctuary. We're going to have to have corporate prayer. And I'm going to tell you something else too. I'm just going to say it right here from pulpit. I'm going to be honest with you, just transparent as I can be. And, I, and on Sunday morning in that worship, we've got to go to a different level. We've got to go somewhere different. We've got to go somewhere different. I'm just being honest with you. We've got to welcome. We've got to host the presence of God. 
Not sing about him. We got to host him. We got to host him. Because Joel, you got children. We ain't losing them children. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Now everybody can run me off. And they can do whatever they want. But on my watch, I'll fight for every soul. Every soul. I'll give my life for every soul. We get, we get very few opportunities. And it's all I know. You're seeing tonight a harm sin of all I know about me and my colleague. This is it laid on the table. I gave my life to say, Father, whatever you want. It ain't about me. It ain't for me. People don't like me. But I can tell you this. At the end of my days, I will have fought for your children with everything in me. Everything in me. It's, it's too important. All we got is the eternal lives of all your family, of all of you. That's all we got. When I stand before Jesus, you're all we got. See it. See it. I won't bring houses, cars, land with me, but I'll bring souls. He'll know the lives I've touched, and that's all I got. That's all I got. He's worth it all. He's worth it all. He's worth it all. Hallelujah, Father. We bless you and give you honor and glory. We do, Father, with every bit of our fiber of our body, Father God. You know. You know our heart. Father, you know our heart. Father God, and what I know is you know this people. Father God, and I'll just be honest. I'll just say it. You sent me here because of these people. Father, you sent me here because of these people. Father God, because these people, Father God, have seen you move. They have seen you touch lives. And for 40, 50 years, they've seen lives changed here at Beulah. Father God, but now you're saying the darkness has increased in the earth and you're going to have to increase with me in power and in victory. You're going to have to increase. I have to tell you right now that what we've done in yesteryear won't work in the year coming. I'm telling you, we're going to have to up our game and change our plan. If we are going to move with God, He is not a God of yesterday. He is right now and He's forever. We have got to walk in the light as He is in the light and keep progressing forward. We must keep progressing forward with the King. We must. We must. The enemy is advancing while the church has slept. We must wake up and say, we're activating. We're activating. We're moving forward. We're activating. I want to thank Brother John. I want to thank uh, the, the, the Board of Deacons, Pastor Lamar, for that building being built over there. All of you that had given to it and all those things. Listen to me. Listen. I'm telling you. You know, at first to me, I'm like, praise God, building another building. That's great. The fact of the matter is, is that that's vision. And I just have to believe in my heart that Father has such great plans for it it supersedes what we think. It ain't in vain. It may be a struggle. Brother John might be a bunch of headaches. But I'm going to tell you right now I claim glory. I claim it full with youth. I believe we can see revival in our schools. I mean revival. I believe we can see a radically changed central Louisiana. I believe it. I believe it. God loves us. He loves us all. He loves every church. He loves us all. He does. He's just looking for some people that will pursue him. He's just looking for some people who will say, I'll lay myself aside and I'm pursuing him with all I got. Y'all, look, I know that's not a popular doctrine. or You know what I mean? A message. I know it ain't. I know it's not self-serving. But it's all I got. It's what I see. It's just the way I see it. So I tell you tonight, I'm going to give it all I got. I thank you all for your support of me, my wife, my family. Thank God, Pastor Lamar, close friend, mentor, man of God, I love dearly. Thank God for all y'all. Father, bless these people. Bless this church. 
Father, as we seek your face. Father, start with us and you do it so loving and gentle. Father, you'll do it in our prayer time. You'll do it on the way home and you'll just speak to our heart. Father, we'll say, Father, God, I can recommit or I can give it all. But just direct my path. i got to say this word right here. Do not let the enemy put you into hard labor thinking we're asking you to do a bunch of physical things. It's given your heart and your passion, your desire for him. That's all I'm asking. The rest is up to him. Check your own heart. How much do you love him? How much will you give him? That's between you and him. Nobody makes me. Nobody, nobody's going to make you. It's personal. Father, tonight every gift offered of ourselves, you accept it with honor. For the Apostle Paul told us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Present your body, living sacrifice. Wholly acceptable unto God, which is the least you can do. It is what you should do. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.